Uh, how's it going? It's like uh, I am not awake yet, but uh, I'm sure I will halfway through this talk. Um, but uh, let's start off with talk. I always like to start off with cats. Uh, you can tell what the theme is. It's about traveling. It's like also good presentations have cats in them. Uh, the title of this talk is Around the World in 80 Cons. Uh, basically, uh, what this talk is about, it's, uh, it's one of the weirdest talks I've given because it started off where I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to talk about this, this coming year. And so then I started doing research on it and I'm like, oh, crap, that's not what I should talk about. It's got to be this now. And so it transitioned. So it's really a weird talk. because it, it starts off here. And then I go to here, and then it brings us to over here. So it's a really weird talk. Uh, but I, I do have to, there are a couple of caveats and stuff. You know, one of the things that you have to know about me is that I alternate my talks every year. It's like I'll do one year, I'll do a technical talk, uh, an offensive talk. Well, most people say my talks are offensive anyway, but I mean like a social engineering, physical compromise, you know, a more technical hacking talk. And then the next year, I'll do a rant or something based on uh, defense or blue team. Uh, but mostly ranting. So last year I did a talk on spear phishing and uh, social engineering and physical compromise. So we know what year this is, right? Uh, and and uh, there's a couple of warnings in this talk. One for the very beginning that we need to get out of the way right now is my apology, okay? Because this will run long, okay? It's just going to. And I think it's adorable when the volunteers come up with the time signs that say time's up and stuff, you know, several times during it or they walk up to me, it's just gonna run long. It's like uh, my technical talks, it's like, and I feel bad, and it's not like, and I'm not saying that with pride, I feel bad about it, but I'm very passionate about this talk, and I've never done it under an hour and stuff, you know, and I just keep going. So I'm the guy who screwed up the schedule, I'm that guy, and I apologize in advance for that. Second of all, a friend of mine who used to, uh, who uh, still lives in South Africa, he came up to me after uh, a version of this talk, and he said, Jason, I'm from a very conservative country and stuff, you know, so the only thing I could get from halfway through your talk is, why is the angry man screaming at me? And so I just want you to understand, it's like when I start getting screaming and a little riled up, I said, I'm not screaming, you know, at you, I'm screaming with you. So we'll, we'll get that going. And uh, I think that's about it. So uh, those are the, the warnings. Also, just another warning, uh, just right off the bat, is like, I'm very cranky in the morning. So it's like, it might be a little bit more fire than usual. So. Uh, but this is, it's also, this is the last talk of the year, uh, so I'm going to just finish it up really quick. Uh, one of the things that you need to know about me, quite simply, is I love to travel. Uh, I don't just love to travel, I love to explore. Uh, that middle picture at the Taj Mahal was taken last week, it's like uh, when I was in New Delhi. It's like, uh, I love to go out and see, uh, not just going to the conference and talking to the hackers, but also seeing the culture, seeing how, what they're into, what they're interested in, what they're trying to do, but then also I've spent like over 11 hours walking through the Zidane district in Beijing and stuff, you know, just a complete circle, uh, walking around and stuff, you know, just to see what I could see. Uh, and then there was like a, one time I was in Cairo, it's like I walked from the Coptic area all the way up to the Cairo Tower, it was about seven hours, it's like there was a great pizza hut on the Nile River, which was like really good. Uh, and, uh, and just doing things like that, just walking through, I'm not just seeing the tourist sites, but walking through the streets, seeing the city, seeing the people and stuff, you know, seeing what they're doing, seeing what the cultures, seeing how they're greeting people, seeing how they, they do things, because I just like the culture. Uh, so I thought, you know what, let me do a talk about my travels and about the different cultures in the world and stuff, you know, and how I perceive them. And that's the key thing about this whole talk. The one thing that keeps it all the way threaded together is the fact that it's based on perceptions. Mine. I don't speak for anybody else. Just like Russ Rogers says, I like tacos. That means all hackers like tacos, right? No, it's like, you know, it's like, it's, it, I'm only going to speak on my perspective, on my perceptions. It's like, in what I see it, your mileage may vary. It's like, oh, we got a little microphone stand thing. Yeah. I know, but I'm going to try to see if I can. Oh, darn. Get my hopes up. What's up with that? Okay. So we're going to keep going. Is that one working now? Okay. I don't even try to pretend to be professional. Okay, uh, so let's get into the uh, thing right here, right off the bat, and one of the things I wanna take off the table right now. When I talk about uh, hacking and I talk about uh, global uh, aspects of it, one of the first things that everybody comes and starts talking about is freaking nation state. It's like, and global countries, and they try to bring all that crap into it, okay? 
That's not me. That's not what this is about. So let's get this stuff out of the way right off the bat and stuff, you know. So you start about nation states and stuff, you know, you always go back to those breach reports, right? Like here's the Verizon data breach report and stuff, you know. And I'm not trying to call their baby ugly and stuff, you know, because I've gone on some Twitter wars about this stuff, you know. I'm just saying this is some of the data. All I tried to point out was that maybe this isn't everything that's out there. It's like you look at the upper left-hand corner, this was the breach report from 13. And if you'll notice, there may be some areas that are, you know, underrepresented possibly just a little bit, you know, maybe just not like showing the whole picture there. Well, they try to fix that, you know, their marketing team, I'm sorry, I mean, the research team uh, decided in 14, say, oh, you know what? When there's a breach in Hoboken, New Jersey, all of USA. Oh, there was a breach in Wuxi, China, all of China, problem solved, you know? It's like, it's now a more complete report. Except for even doing that creative reporting they still didn't get everything. I'm sure there's, I mean, there's gotta be like a couple computers in Mongolia, come on, seriously? It's like, they've got Wi-Fi. It's like, they're very mobile people. I know they've got some hot spots going around. It's like, you know, so it's like they go and they, they do that, and they, they do this report, and they try to show that they're trying to get more data. And they're not the only ones. It's like, you've got TrustWave right here, upper left-hand corner from 13. Once again, uh, not the greatest representation, but in their favor, they've got pie, because you know, we all love pie. So that's awesome. It's like, uh, so they, they got that one. And then in 14, once again, they're trying to change the fact it's like showing about how much they represent and how much data they've got. They decide to invite everybody to a rave, though I don't think I was cool enough to get into this one. It's like, because I mean, that's exactly what it looks like to me. It's like, I think that little ball with the green thing is supposed to be the earth after a seismic shift of cataclysmic proportions. Uh, but yeah, that, that's data there somewhere in that. And stuff, you know, so that's the report and that's how they try to show that data. That's how they try to show like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's happening in the world. One of the best sites though, when you talk about breaches and you talk about attacks and stuff, you know, is hackmageddon.com. And one of the main reasons why I like hackmageddon.com is, you know, first thing again, you know, pie. But second, it's got the flags on, on, on the little pie slices. And let's face it, we're in America. The only time we know about other countries' flags is when we're invading them, right? So it's refreshing to see that before it happens. So we actually get to see flags, you know, other than that. So that's awesome. So it's like, but one of the best things about the site is this right here, the disclaimer, where the guy says, Again, no need to repeat that data must be taken very carefully since they do refer only to the discovered attacks, the so-called tip of the iceberg, and hence do not pretend to be exhausted, but only aim to provide a high-level overview of the global cyber landscape. That is such an awesome disclaimer that I'm gonna overlook the use of the word cyber in it, okay? It's just, it's just that good. Because he's saying, this is what I see. This is all that I see. There's totally, definitely more going on but this is my representation of what I've got. And I thought that was very honest, and I thought that was a very good site, and he's got some really good data. It's not all the data, but it's something. It, it gives us a facet of it. Uh, more sites are more technical, and they try to use their data that way. Uh, this is uh, digitalattackmap.com. Do you notice something going on here? This isn't a screenshot from War Games. This is actually from the website. And I saw this picture tweeted out all over the Twitter sphere, and I'm like, wow, that's really bad. That looks like something bad's going down there and stuff, you know? What are those guys up to? And then I went to the site and I actually started looking through the site some more. And I realized something that was going on here. It was that they were trying to manipulate the message by using data. And they were being totally obvious about it because look at here, this is on May 9th, but you go to June 7th, oh, that's a little bit different. That tells a little bit of a different story. That's, this story says China's just minding its own business, hanging out and stuff, you know, while everybody else is just going all crazy and stuff and attacking, right? That's, the, that's what the story is, right? That's what's really happening. No, I picked this screenshot because it fit my narrative so I can manipulate your emotions and help tell my story. The only difference is I'm honest about it. And also, I, in my honesty, I also left a little bit more of the, uh, le uh, the legend down there in the lower left-hand corner. Because if you notice, the legend says when it's radiating outward like that, that's an internal attack. So that means all this stuff in the, in, uh, around the United States is internal. 
That's US on, U, USA on USA violence right there going on. That's what's happening there. But that's not what the story looks like. But for some reason, this picture didn't get tweeted out all over the Twitter sphere. Because it's even what he's narrative and stuff. You know, that doesn't sell firewalls and blinky lights, right? No. So uh, speaking of selling firewalls and blinky lights, we got to mention, you know, the Mandy report, right? I don't know at what point and stuff, you know, when uh, Richard Baitlick was a young boy that China came over collectively and stole his lunch money, but it hurt him really bad. It's like, I mean, I really want to have like a teddy bear and stuff, you know, and take it up to Tao Security and just go, hey, Tao, just show me on the doll. Where, where did China touch your network? It, it's okay, you know? It's like, because this guy is just like, it's all about how horrible and stuff, you know, China is. It's like, it's like all there, it's all collective and stuff, you know, and it's just all that data. And I'm not, it's not just for me. I'm not just saying that that's just my perception of the problem. It's like, I did a Google image search because I was doing this, this PowerPoint. I was like, I did a Google image search for Mandiant Report. I kid you not, this was the first response. That was the first image result. So I may not be the only one and stuff, you know, that's saying that that's a little bit skewered, that's a little bit, you know, once again, using number and data to paint the picture that you want to show. And so, I, I'm, and I'm gonna go, so just for the sake of it, just to get this out of the way, just get the whole nation state story to bed and stuff, you know, let's just say this, let's agree, the Chinese are bad, right? Chinese are bad because they spy on their citizens. They spy on other countries. They infect other nations' computers with malware. They try to censor the press. They try to suppress protesters. You know, and it's always awkward when I get to the slide and stuff, you know, because I go to Beijing a lot and stuff, you know, and so, you know, I was like, and I've had some, yeah, you know, one time it's like at DEF CON, there was like at least three people I know from, from China that was just sitting there in the audience going like, yes, continue. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's like, uh, well, let's go. It's like, we're going to agree. The Chinese are bad because of these five things. Let's go through these five things, right? They, uh, they get to spy on their citizens. You know, that's not cool, right? No one wants that to happen. Oops. It's like, but one of my favorite parts about all this stuff that's going on here is this lower right-hand corner and stuff. We finally figured out what the problem with APT is. No one's apologizing. See, the CIA does it, but they apologized afterwards. So it's all cool. It's all good. You know, it's like, sorry, oops, my bad. You know, it's like, we didn't mean to do that. See, so now every other nation state, if you realize, and stuff, you know, after you hack the government servers and stuff, you know, send an apology letter, we're cool. We're all good after that. See, so that's, I think, one of the biggest things that they're missing. So uh, what else do they do? Oh, they spy on other countries. Yeah, that's not cool, spying on other countries like that. I mean, and look at, look at Merkel here. How bad of a person or a country do you have to be to make a German look that sad? I mean, seriously, that's just not, she got groped by George W. She didn't look that bad, you stuff, you know? That's just sad right there. And then look in the lower left-hand corner, Italian magazine says the US spies listen to the Pope, Vatican says unaware. You spied on the Pope? And I don't care if you're atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, okay? We gotta admit one important factor here, okay? This is a pretty cool pope, okay? I mean, he dresses up as a regular priest and goes around Vatican City at night feeding the homeless. He's like the good guy Batman. He takes selfies, I mean, come on. This is a pretty good pope. Now that other guy with the red shoes and the hat, he looked a little sketchy, I could totally understand that, okay? But not this one, this one's a good one. Let's keep this one, right? So it's like, so, it's like, so they did that, so that, that's not cool. But I mean, at least, you know, you're thinking, oh, well, you can't say nothing about uh, uh, infecting other countries with malware because that's an act of war. And uh, actually trying to implement, you know, changes into another co uh, country's uh, control systems, that would be horrible. It's like um, one of the best things I've liked about Stuxnet more than anything else was the denial. That has got to be one of the most legendary denials in history. It's like the White House press guy going up there and going like, how dare you accuse us of such a well-orchestrated, totally masterful, genius-like maneuver and stuff. You know, I mean, how could you dare think that we were capable of such a masterful work of art that was done during that thing. I mean, that was just sub sublime. It's like, I, how, how could you accuse us of that? It wasn't us, you know? It's like, I loved it. One of the best denials I've ever seen and stuff, right? It's like, so you got that going on. 
I, I, love, and I love when I get to this part and stuff, you know, I can always tell the, where the feds are in the room, by the way. So it's like, sorry, guys. It's like, um, but what about else did we go to? Uh, they tried to censor the press. Well, that's horrible because, you know, we've got the First Amendment going for us, right? So that's always good. Uh, look at the, lower, the upper left-hand corner right there, the one with the tear gas going on. They're tear gassing Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera's had their offices bombed in Syria. Their reporters are under arrest and stuff, you know, for reporting facts in Egypt. It's like right now being tortured and stuff, you know, and imprisoned in, in Egypt. And so luckily they were able to get the, I would think that the press crew and stuff, you know, that was like said, hey, sorry about all those other guys going on, but don't worry, you're not, we're not sending you to Syria. We're not sending you to uh, Egypt. Just go over to Missouri and stuff, you know, and film some stuff and protest. It'll be totally fine. And you know, those reporters are going like, crap. You know, it's like, it's like, I want to switch over to the Egypt office. It's like, and, and don't worry, the police officers were nice enough to confiscate, I mean, uh, collect their equipment so it didn't get stolen or damaged. So that was nice of the police for doing that and stuff, you know, I thought that was good. And, uh, and speaking of the police and, and their helpfulness and stuff, you know, well, not that guy who tries to shoot people and stuff, you know, because they have cameras. Uh, let's talk about, they try to uh, suppress protesters. That's some terrifying pictures right there. And one of the key things that upsets me the most about this picture, and one that was the most disturbing, is not the guys with the, the riot guns there, or the, that's actually a police officer, that's a police officer patch, that's not military in, in Kabul or anything and stuff, you know. It's this guy right here in the center. That is one of the most terrifying pictures I've seen, because you do not see rage in his eyes. He's not angry, he's not mad, He's not vindictive. That is an unprepared, I don't know how trained, terrified man panicking and stuff in a situation that he's not familiar with or not comfortable with. If he had rage, he'd be more controlled. This is the guy that was most likely, if anything, was going to shoot somebody. And he's got a non-lethal shotgun. Would that have mattered if someone heard shots being fired? Wouldn't have mattered. Someone wasn't going to have a good day on that day. It's like, and that shows just how bad it gets. It's like, because that's not anger. That's not vindictiveness. That's just a human being panicking and in a situation that he doesn't know how to totally cope with. It's like, but let's finish it up because if you noticed, you know, in my little funny way, I'm trying to say, basically, we're all doing it. You can't just say X country is bad because they do X things. It's like, okay, is that one working now? My arm's getting tired. I'm tired and I need to hold Pepsi, so hold on. All right, there we go. So, what I'm basically trying to say is we're all doing it. As, as so, so, there we go. Okay, here we go. We're going to get this done eventually. Can y'all hear me now? Can you hear me now? Does that help? They're totally punky with the mic. Can y'all hear me in the back? I'm going to scream louder, I promise, okay? Trust me, as I get on through here, I get even more ragey and louder. So look at this. Look at this map. This is the map of around the world's all the control centers, okay? Take a good look at it. Look at Canada. Canada's attacking us. When you got Canadians going after you, there's no hope for humanity, people, okay? I mean, I can just imagine those, those guys and stuff, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm sorry, you've got MSO 1466. I'm going to have to pwn your network. I apologize. You know, I mean, they, 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 did, they, they did apologize afterwards. I mean, those, the, those guys were doing it before the CIA thought it was cool, you know? It's like, so you got to appreciate that. But basically, everybody's doing it. If you say, I'm trying to prote uh, protect myself from this country because this country is doing bad things, you're screwed. Because it's not just one country doing it, it's everybody. It's like including your own country, you know, the attacks coming from within inside the country, you know, it's like what's inside the house. It's, you've got to watch out for those things. You can't just say it's one guy. So I'm done talking about nation states and other governments. Screw those guys. Let's talk about culture. Let's talk about people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell, show two slides. One slide, I'm going to tell a story or an observation from uh, when I was in that region. And the next slide is, I sent out an email uh, questionnaire to a lot of my friends from all over the world, and I said, hey, please fill this out with all these questions and get them back to me so I can see what your perceptions are from your side of it, from actually living there and being in that country. Tell me what you think. And so that's what happened. 
And, and this is also when the story started to change right here, because uh, let's start off with Asia. Uh, one of the things I used to like to talk about was um, my first experience. Uh, in 2008, I first got my passport. It was only in 2008. Uh, so, of course, you know, naturally, the very first place I decided to get uh, to go uh, was to Beijing. It's like to a hacking conference in China, because why not, right? So uh, I go there, and I go to this conference, and I see an eye-opening experience about what I thought was the issues and what wasn't. And I usually talk about that experience, but what I saw in July was even cooler because I invited Dave Kennedy to come over and speak to the Beijing Institute of Technology. Uh, I, I'm working with them creating a hacker exchange program, and it's way scarier than it sounds. And so it's like, and I had him come over and give a talk there, and his reaction was awesome because he came over there at the very beginning thinking, oh, they're going like, to take my laptop, they're going to take it apart, or they're going to have people spying on us, people are going to walk us around and stuff, you know, and we're going to be controlled about where we go. And at the end of the time that was over, when I'm sending him to the, taking him to the airport to say goodbye, he came to me and like, Jason, that was one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. It's like we took the subway, we walked through Hohai Lake. It's like we got to see the Starbucks and stuff, you know. It's like we got to eat at Pizza Hut. It's like we, we got to see exactly what the Chinese culture was like. We got to see what the people were like. And he got to see that besides all the stuff that you say, this is what it's like on the ground. And it's amazing from what you see in the press to see what you're supposed to be reported and what we're supposed to fear to what's actually happening on the ground, to the actual citizens, the actual people that are just doing their day-to-day -day stuff. So it was really great to watch that transition for him and stuff, you know, to see that. Uh, so let's go and talk about the, uh, for someone else's perception, it's a, uh, this is going to be really weird because this is a really small font and this is a really big crane in here. But let's start reading this, like, what country do you currently live in and what country have you spent most of your time in and more familiar with? Uh, these aren't all the questions, but these are like the top four questions I wanted to use to help fit my narrative. So we're going to use these questions. He says, I currently live in China. I spend half and half between the U.S. and China. How did you find out about hacking? I love this answer. Just a simple thought. How can I get unlimited game golden rice at the beginning that I can beat Romance of Three Kingdoms? Which I think is awesome because, I mean, let's face it. I play World of Warcraft, and I hate freaking going on those freaking quests collecting dragon eggs when I just need to freaking just, you know, go kill stuff, right? It's like, who wants to do that? So he was like, yeah, that's hard. It's like, I want to just have fun. Let's see if I can just hack the system and stuff, you know, and get my stuff all ready for me. So, you know, that was an honest answer. I thought that was a good way to start learning to hack. In your region, how is hacking seen uh, by the general public? Overall, it's still a trend toward negative. Public lack of understanding. Even people accepted hacking as a skill, a method, but most of the people stay away from it. And this is China, you know, the land of APT, right? It's like, and this is one of the most nuanced answers that I got uh, at the end. Is hacking in your region seen as more for crime hackers, nation state, or other? Public media defines it. It depends on official needs. Today, it may be a crime. Next day, it becomes national heroes. Someday, it is a technical challenge. Like most of the place, it is a mixture. Some of criminals can be used for national interest, Sabu, <coughs> and um, under certain control, uh, like giving them a list of 30 countries they can hack. Uh, official security workers may conduct hacktivist or crime in his or her leisure time, Snowden. Uh, some can be hired for overseas interest. That is like one of the most nuanced answers that I've seen from, this, from this, these results. It's like, and this is from, uh, from China. And so I thought that was really good. I thought that was a, a really uh, a good response, a really nuanced response. Um, so let's go to the next one. Let's go to uh, Europe. Uh, one of my favorite conferences in Europe is uh, Hack in Paris and Nuit de Hack. Uh, they, they, uh, Hack in Paris is like the black hat. It's like on like Tuesday through Friday. And then Saturday is the Nuit de Hack. Uh, it is actually translated to Night of Hacks. They start off at like 10 o'clock in the morning and they have talks in front, and it's this huge hangar and stuff, you know, and Euro Disney. Yes, at Euro Disney. It's like there's this huge hangar of like 2,000 hackers and they give talks up on stage up until around 7 p.m. And then from 8 p.m. till 8 a.m., it is Capture the Flag, Wild Wild West, just teams from all over Europe uh, doing this challenge, the CTF. And then at the same time they're doing the CTF, they've got workshops for lock picking and drones and VR and, and hardware and 3D printing and just make it, just all these wonderful times to network and learn and just and, and socialize until Sunday morning. It's awesome. It's like a distilled 24 hour DEF CON. It's great. It's like, uh, and, but the, I do have one complaint and one of the creepiest moments of my life. 
uh, was because of Nui to hack. Because, you know, like I said, they're at Euro Disney. So there is nothing more creepier than being a guy like me in a black hoodie with sunglasses on with a big silver suitcase with all these hacker stickers on it and stuff, you know, waiting at the Charles de Gaulle airport by myself waiting for the Disney shuttle. <laughs> yeah, it was not cool. It's like there was this one little, a uh, uh, couple years ago, this little girl was trying to run up to me to see me and stuff, you know, and her dad just like grabbed her and was like pulled her away. And my first response was, dude, not even mad. That was a good call, bro. I look pretty sketchy, you know? It's like, I mean, it was like totally. So my only problem with Nui to Hack is they need to get a dedicated shuttle from the airport because that is just a creepy moment. So once you get to Euro Disney, it's fine because you're, you're among all the other 2,000 guys in black t-shirts and jeans. But at that airport, not so much. So uh, let's talk to a guy, uh, what country we're familiar with. He's just currently, I live in the UK eight years, but I grew up in Poland where I lived for 25. How did you find out about hacking? From media stories told at the Computer Market Exchange, uh, he says, darn, that sounds very old school. He says, yes. Uh, when a group called Gumsy hacked the NASP, main internet org in Poland, and they only uh, .pl register at the time, and then they followed on. So I thought that was cool. It's like that's a good way to learn it. He's learned it from the media. It's one of the few times where I've actually seen media actually help people get into hacking. In your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? In Poland, I guess it's mostly seen as completely illegal activity. In the UK, any wrongdoing with computers is called hacking. And general public thrives on misguided media reports. Don't they? It's like, is hacking in your region seen as more for crime hacktivism, nation state or other? And Poland is mostly crime hacktivism, but there are reports of Polish military ordering the creation of an offensive botnet, which I'm sure is totally going to end well and stuff for Poland. Uh, this came out via some leaked documents recently, i.e. a member of the public was bothered to read them from the official government website. So, you know, you gotta hate it when they, you know, find out those informations from the stuff that they published. Uh, hacktivism is publicly visible, but not much going on. There is recently Nation State. We constantly get reminded that XYZ is trying to attack us. And now that we have elite cyber warriors volunteering from private sector to help Spook's army develop offensive capabilities, this is public knowledge after announcement by the government on national TV. So in the UK, it's all above and changing proportions. Once again, and stuff, you know, it seems toward negative. It's like, it doesn't matter which region that I've seen yet and stuff, you know, it, it seems toward the negative. Well, let's talk about the nation state. Uh, and especially when we talk about the criminal aspect of it, it's like, it was really funny because I was in Recife, Brazil, and I was having a, a speaker dinner. And I was talking to, to one of the hackers there, and he was like, yeah, Jason, it's just, it's not the same here in Brazil, man. It's not that cool being a hacker here and stuff, you know, it's like, Hacking's not illegal, so the girls don't think we're like edgy or outlaws or, or anything and stuff, you know? They just think we're geeks and stuff, you know? They get money, and it's like, that's not cool. And I mean, how do you respond to, I'm sorry you haven't been arrested yet? I mean, keep going, maybe you'll get jail time? I mean, how do you respond to that guy, right? So I was just like, okay, cool, you know? Well, good news is, is that they, Brazil has recently enacted computer laws and stuff, you know? So now he's a criminal. I guess, right? Yay? It's like, so that was my experience and stuff, you know, in, in Brazil with that one meeting that stuck in my mind there. Uh, but this guy's from Brazil. Uh, he found out about hacking from trying to get things done. Is that the hacker credo or what? I'm trying to get something done. I need to get, how does this work? How do I make it happen? He says, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Nowadays, there's a mix of good and bad. People sort of understand it. Back in the day, early 90s, internet wasn't quite widespread. BBSs or stolen credentials to universities were the way to go. All, uh, at the point in time, unless you were doing something, you wouldn't really be aware of hacking. With online banking being implemented in 96, 97, bankers' activities started increasing quickly in Brazil. Bankers' activities, credit card fraud, credit card theft, and stealing from the actual bank accounts. So uh, they started getting aware when you know, people started making money off of it. Is hacking your region is more for crime hacktivists, nation state or other? Considering those that don't know anything about it and just see the stuff in the news, mostly uh, tied to crime and sometimes hacktivism. In the corporate world, a better understanding to ethical hacking. You see a trend here? I sent out this thing to all over the world. This is not the cherry picked you know, narrative of, of the responses I'm getting. These are all consistently almost the same. And this is when my talk started to change as well, again, for a second time. It's like, so uh, let's talk about Africa. My only trip to Africa was to Egypt. And yes, I know a lot of friends, especially in the Middle East, that Jason, Egypt is part of the Middle East. It's not part of Africa, but I needed, uh, I've only been to Egypt. It's on the continent. It counts. Leave me alone. It's called speaker, you know, uh, 
what is that called? Uh, prerogative. There we go. So, uh, so in Cairo, it was really cool about that was the conference. The conference itself was really cool there. First of all, they were at a total disadvantage because they made me wear a suit. And that makes me appear normal until you start interacting with me and you realize that's far from the truth. So I feel sorry for those people right off the bat and stuff, you know, because they thought they're, and I helped swiftly disabuse them of that notion of me being normal by doing rabbit ears when people asked me to take pictures with them. And one of my favorite ones was a college student taking that picture. You know that picture you take, right, in front of the, the, the banner of the conference that you're going, that, that I'm here picture. You're not, but I'm here. Yeah, uh, trust me, everybody takes that picture. It's like I take them all the time, so you know, it's, like, it all, it's always done. It's like, uh, so uh, he was taking that picture in his nice suit, not knowing that there was a crazy American 20 feet behind him going like this, totally photobombing him. It was awesome. I love that picture. Uh, but what got me there with the culture and stuff, you know, in Egypt is how formal and just, just so very just official and efficient the conference was with hackers in it. And I could not tell hackers versus government versus officials versus security people versus whatever at the conference. But by golly, when that conference was over and those ties started coming off and the jacket, I could start saying, oh, there's the hackers, there's that guy, there's that guy. And we started having these awesome conversations. Once it was no longer an official event, it's like it started becoming more relaxed, more uh, exchange, more information exchange, which is what I usually go for. So uh, this guy was like, uh, he's from Egypt. And he's like, how did I find out about hacking? And I love this answer. This is the best answer I received through the whole, all the summaries. Caught a virus in 2005 because a certain person downloaded a pirated game and it was backdoored, wondered how those virus worms worked, learned some programming first by viewing sample virus sources and walked that road and, knew, uh, walked that road and never went back. Awesome. The guy was basically, well, I got pwned. That's horrible. Wait, how did that happen? Maybe I should research it. Taught himself, learned, went and developed and worked and got his skills up. He's one of the best forensic analysts in Egypt now. And he started by just saying, hey, this wasn't cool. How did it happen? Let me go and try to find out and learn. Let me use my curiosity. In your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Hacking is generally viewed as hacking people's Facebook and Yahoo accounts. How sad is that, people? They still use Yahoo. That's just sad. OK, sorry. Um, but so is hacking the Regency is more for crime, hacktivist, nation, state, or other. Most view it as a crime. Few know about hacktivism. Let that sink in for a second. I was there a month before Taha Square. This summary was sent out last year. Hackers are responsible for Arab Spring. Hackers are the ones that got the internet going out to them, creating the DNS entries and stuff, you know, trying to get Tor going, trying to get the, the word out to what was going on there. Hacktivists did that. And now, to this day still, they still see it as crime. Well, let's uh, talk about the Middle East now. It's like uh, I go to, uh, I go to uh, there every once in a while and stuff, you know, and uh, break into places and do bad things. Uh, but also we have some friends there. And it was on one of these times where I was actually uh, with a friend. We were in uh, Beirut, Lebanon uh, at this coffee shop. And my friend's friend uh, was like, he pulled up his laptop. He said, hey, you want to see something really cool? I'm like, sure. It's like, you know, sure, show me something cool. It's like, so I thought there's going to be some new LOL cat pictures or something, right? And he opens it up, and it's the interface, command interface, for the national telecom system. And I was like, cool. He's like, yeah, I'm admin on it. Nice. For the last four years. Oh. <laughs> it's like, and I was like, and so my question was like, so do you have, uh, so you, you get free internet now? You got free phone? It's like, are you listening to other people's calls? It's like, are you a little mini NSA? It's like, what do you do? He's like, no. He's like, I mean, the look on his face was just like, why would you even think that? And he's like, no, I don't do anything with it. I just have admin rights. I just, I just boot it up every once in a while and stuff, you know, just to make sure I'm still admin on it. That's all. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's like, it is like the wild, wild west out there. It's like, I mean, they, there's no concept of, of just the hacking. Thing. It's just more exploration just to see what you can do. And the wireless there, it's like, uh, it's, it's t the internet there is, is totally different. 
So let's talk to a guy from Lebanon. It's like he found out about hacking through BBS and the MRC, you know, Windows user. In your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? There is a huge lack of awareness. Also, lack of exposure to more evolved countries hacking-wise, and just recent high-speed connections made it difficult for young people to grow up with good access to that culture. There are no landlines in Lebanon, hardly any. It's like if you're in, you carry your internet in your pocket with a 4G or 3G hotspot. It's like that's where mostly all their internet comes from is through mobile units. Uh, is hacking in your region seen as more for crime, hacked in this nation, state, or other? Again, the lack of awareness results in people just hearing about hacking on the news. And since media just reports on cyber criminals, that is the way they see hackers in general. Once again, I like the way he's, he's, he worded that. It's carefully worded that. Since media just reports on cyber criminals, because that's who they are. It's like, but that's what the perception sees is people sees hackers in general. So let's talk about the U.S. It's like, everybody know Bruce Potter? It's like uh, from Shmukon, G Dad. It's like I, I, I love I love Bruce because he's like one of the only persons that I will go and give non-consensual awkward hugs to, because he runs the farthest and stuff. You know, it's harder to catch him, so I make sure it's worth it. Uh, and so, uh, and this is uh, that one was actually taken at Shmukon uh, a couple years ago. Uh, one of the, the conferences I like to talk about in America is there. There is there are a lot of great conferences here. It's like I mean you're at one of them right now. It's like, but DefCon, DerbyCon, Shmukon are like to me, like the main points of my family reunion. Uh, but DEF CON, of course, being the DEF CON fanboy, it's like I have to say, uh, 10 years ago, I wouldn't be here right now speaking to you if it wasn't for DEF CON. If it wasn't for a fact of the next conference, not giving me a chance, because trust me, I totally screwed up my first chance. I was a total dweeb, noob, it was horrible. It's like they gave me a second chance. It's like, and that's what made all the difference. It's like they were giving me that second chance to, to actually show what I can do, what, I, what, what I'm capable of, and creating a network of friends and family that I still know and keep to to this day. I, I talk more and know more about what's going on with most of my hacker friends from around the world than I know what's going on with my family in Houston and stuff, you know, which always makes Thanksgiving awkward, which is next week, so, which I fly back to. So, uh, but yeah, that's my family. And it's like, and this is my family, this is my culture and stuff, you know, and that's why I, I talk about this and this is why I'm passionate about it, is I don't just see it as a community. So, um, what country we're familiar with? USA, America. Uh, How did you find out about hacking? Uh, first experienced it when my roommate was talking smack in AOL chat room. I always chuckle with AOL. Uh, hacker changed my screensaver to immediately scroll, you've been hacked, which is the surest way of figuring it out, as soon as the mouse stopped moving. In your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Negative for the most part, we are demonized and publicized as criminals. Is hacking your region seen as more for crime, hacking this nation state or other? Crime to the public size. This was not my talk. My talk was supposed to be about how Malaysians really like hackerspaces and they create hackerspaces and, and, and 3D printing and trying to make things and do maker uh, spaces. It's like my talk was supposed to be about how the Germans are into encryption and privacy rights. My talk was supposed to be about the Brazilians and the cars. My talk was supposed to be about the diversity of this culture, the diversity of this community. But instead, I found one uniting thread that united all of us. We're seen as criminals. And I'm not happy about that. And you shouldn't be either, because this is who we come from. These are hackers. We are artists, creators, and inventors. Alan Turing, on the left, the godfather of cryptography, saved thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives during World War II, helping break the Enigma machine. After the war, his social lifestyle led him to castration and then suicide. That was the thanks for his service from his country. Nikolai Tesla, the godfather of open source. We are afraid of so many of his inventions and discoveries because of the simple fact he didn't want to make a profit on it. So corporations wouldn't back him. So they gave that to freaking Edison. Screw that dude. It's like, but that's Tesla. His reward. The greatest love in his life was a pigeon he uh, nursed back to health in Central Park. The maid found him two days after he died in his hotel room alone. That was his reward. Ada Lovelace, the first computer programmer. You know this whole women in tech debate, you know, uh, hacker feminist Barbie and stuff, you know, let me put this whole debate to rest real quick, okay? 
Women started this industry. They led us into it. Done. End of discussion. Her life story, ostracized by her family until she uh, died from the treatment of cancer, not the cancer itself. And yes, I could talk about Grace Hopper, you know, or I could talk about Leonardo da Vinci, because those were uber hackers. But they actually did pretty well. You know, Leonardo da Vinci was surrounded by friends and family. A prince gave him a mansion to retire in. It's like he died with relatives next to his bed. He was very well loved and respected even to this day. Grace Hopper had a destroyer named after her. It's like rear admiral and stuff, you know. It's like one of the most uh, decorated and, and commandeered woman and stuff, you know. Created the whole thing about debugging and stuff, you know, by finding a moth in the computer. Her life was totally freaking rocking. It's like, and that doesn't fit my narrative, and I'm trying to manipulate your emotions, okay? Once again, you know, I'm honest. So, uh, so let's not talk about those guys. Let's just center on these other guys, right? Because that's the way hacking is themed. My question is, when did we become the villain in the story? When did this happen? 200 years ago, we were inventors and creators and artists, and now we're seen as this. What happened 40 years ago? Let's look at some criminals from just 40 years ago. Some actual cyber criminals, some computer criminals. Let's look at these guys. These criminals actually gained, uh, they somehow got access to an administrative password, they stole it, and used it to steal the company's internal accounting file. Alan doesn't go into details about how they got the password. They were hoping to decrypt the file to get one of the free accounts, but they got caught and the company booted them. What was their punishment? What was Bill Gates' punishment for that? That criminal got his access revoked, his free access revoked. And our punishment was we got Vista. But you know, it's like, that's how that worked. That's how these criminals worked. Now, if you wanna see some real criminals, we're talking some, these guys, straight up hood. These thugs and stuff, you know, were dealing blue boxes out of the back of their car and stuff on the street corner. They were slinging that tech to anybody that wanted to pay for it that was used to actually officially defraud a company for the profits that they deserved for the services they were providing. These criminals hated telephone companies so much that I'm presenting on an iPad right now. You know, how many people are tweeting right now with their iPhone about how much Steve Jobs hated telephones? There you go. That's what happened to these criminals just 40 years ago. What happened four years ago? In 2010, another young man who'd already founded a multi-million dollar company, he already made his money, broke into a utility closet at, at MIT. He hooked up a laptop to the campus network and downloaded four million academic journal articles, most of them in the public domain. They were already free from a paid archive to which he had an actual subscription to. He was arrested, indicted twice on multiple counts of fraud, and in a trial that would have begun in April, could have faced 15 years in federal prison and a $1 million fine. His name was Aaron Schwartz, and the government handed him to death. Period. That's how the criminals are treated now. That's not acceptable. Let's look at some sentencing. Now, I'm not going to talk about who was right or who was wrong. I'm talking about numbers. Jeremy Hammond, 10 years for hacking. We got 10 years for hacking. It got overturned because finally someone realized this stuff, you know, doing automated, uh, you know, Earl transversals and stuff, you know, really wasn't a crime. You know, the whole WGED is not a crime thing. Max Ray Butler, 13 years for hacking. Roman Vega, 18 years for hacking. Albert Gonzalez, 20 years for hacking. Justified or not, let's look at some contrast. Malik Richmond, one year for rape. He's already out and still on the high school football team. Uh, Trent, uh, Jared uh, Becker, one year for involuntary manslaughter of a firefighter doing his job. Trent Mays, two years for rape. Seth Hornberger, three to six years for voluntary manslaughter. Got a good lawyer to plead down. Jessica Ferracio, five years for murder of a 23-month-old toddler. She was babysitting him, bashed his head in. I tell people, if you want to commit a computer crime, you better have a dead body next to you so you'll get a lighter sentence. And that would be funny if it wasn't so true. And I had a guy come up to me and talk to me after a conference. He said, Jason, you know, one of the problems is, is that it's, it's not this stuff. It's, it's just that we're used to murder. We've had thousands of years to get used to people killing each other and raping each other and assaulting each other. It's like juries are familiar with that. We know that stuff. But computers are scary. 
Computers are new. We're not familiar with that. And I thought about that, and it's like, how incredibly sadly true that statement is. It's like, and we, we, we keep it going, right? We like to be the mysterious figures. Guess what, people? It's like, you be that mysterious figure. But, people, but juries are made of people. And what people don't understand, they fear. And what they fear, they try to destroy. So good luck with that. That's how that is. And that's the situation that we're at now. And how do they get those symbols of fear? How do they become so mysterious? How do we become these, these shadowy figures of doom? These guys. Look at these guys right here. It looks like the freaking Nazgul coming after me. I want to throw a ring at it every time I see the picture. It's like, seriously, Frodo. It's like, and then look at all these other pictures. I mean, how horrible is that? I, I tell you, I, li I have a computer room that's got its own separate air conditioner, okay? That room is nice and cold. It has never been so cold and stuff, you know, that I needed the hoodie and the ski mask at the same time, okay? That's just never has happened. And I know people, some say that's like, well, they, use the, they wear the ski mask and stuff, you know, so the webcam won't be turned on and they can see them. So, dude, you're probably working in Linux. The webcam doesn't work anyway. Give that up, okay? <laughs> it's like, that's just the way that is. So it's like, so this is what, but one of the things, once again, we don't like the public de demonizing us this way. We don't like the press representing this way unless we're the ones helping with that image. And, so, and I told Miko, I love Miko, he's a great guy, but I told him, it's like I had to put him in here to make fun of him because those other three guys are probably Mossad and they scare me. So we'll just stick with making fun of Miko and stuff, you know, because they actually perpetuate this. Because remember, cause I, I'll tell you a secret, guys, in high school, I wasn't one of the cool kids. I know that's hard to believe. Junior high, I really wasn't one of the cool kids. It's like element, okay, I was never one of the cool kids, ever. But now we get to feel that way. We try to live up to that hype because we want to be seen as the cool kids now. We want to be seen as that mysterious figure. They're using it against us. Sometimes, though, we can have a good counterpoint. That's what I love about the hacker creativity. Because this guy, Chris J, actually decided for Halloween, he was giving out candy on his doorstep, dressed as a hacker and stuff, you know, a stock photo. Had the ski mask on, the computer, his Raspberry Pi was running Kismet, actual Kismet, at the doorstep as he was giving out candy. I thought that was awesome. A nice college representation of the booth was actually, is your network safe from ski mask? <laughs> so I thought that... And hackers are really good at responding. It's like we are good at trying to respond. So, you know, maybe not as much as proactive as we should be, which is part of the problem. But we can respond if we need to. One of my favorite uh, responses is from this article right here. Uh, Glenn Beck criticizes watchdogs for promoting hacking. What the heck is wrong with us? What the heck is wrong with him? And I, and I just got finished from saying this in, like, San Antonio, Texas and stuff, you know, the reddest of the red state. But my, I still stand by this statement to this day. Being on the wrong side of Glenn Beck is being on the right side of history, my personal opinion. So it's like, so I, I just thought it was like, this is just overblown saying, and fear mongering. But that was my response. Well, here's another response, which I think won the internet for this day, was Johnny Bravo actually wrote, tweeted out, I hear watchdogs teaches you how to hack, going to expense for educational training purposes and submit for CISSP cred. Once again, that is one of the best responses I've seen. It's like hackers know how to respond. It's like, give us, uh, give us a time, we'll respond to it. Because we need to respond more. We need to interact more. A perfect example is Sterling Riggs Jerkoff. Uh, this is Sterling Riggs Jerkoff. I get to call him that because we're friends. And this is what he wrote, and I'm going to try to say it in his voice so you understand. He says, I don't know how I feel about this DerbyCon happening at the Hyatt downtown. It's a convention for computer hackers. <gasps> Sessions include password cracking, hacker war games, and a lock-picking pavilion. Thoughts? Well, it's the internet. There were thoughts, right? <laughs> Never read the comments, people. It's just one of those things. Here are some of the comments. Greg Troutman, the LMPD and FBI should break the convention and arrest the people who are doing the training. They were in training, you idiot. It's like Michelle Perry Richardson, scary. She was scared. There's four exclamation points. Freaking Darcy Fraser, so terrified she could only use an emoticon. It's like Connie Gutmer, I bet no arrest, more like employment opportunity. Some really good ones, thank you for asking. Jenny Smith, wow, that's insane. Did you read the rest of the comments, Jenny? It's like Sean Goodman, what about classes on mugging, car theft, and whatever witty else thing he had to say? Brenda Newton Rose, 
Sean, that next week, LOL, she's the funny one in the group. Amber Nicole Sizzle, I think it's stupid. You didn't capitalize I, I think you're stupid, Amber. And Jensen goes to rest them all. <laughs> Seriously, I thought the targeted Facebook ads on this thread would be for pitchforks and fire. But guess what happened instead? Iron Geek, Adrian Crenshaw, he saw this. And so he tweeted out to all those lonely hackers in the airport waiting to go home from DerbyCon, say, hey guys, y'all should check out this thread and comment on it and stuff, you know, and, and, and add your stuff. And we're hackers. We love to comment, right? <laughs> and so that's exactly what we did. And, and yes, I, I have to be, once again, I have to be honest, there was some trolling. A little bit of trolling, okay? 90, okay, we'll go 90% of the comments, though. We're educational, we're informative. We're trying to teach the people in there that were fearing us what we were about. Trying to show the people, no, this is what it was done. We're trying to learn about these vulnerabilities. We're trying to learn about these things so we can better defend you and protect you. We're doing this because we need to try to protect the internet. We need to try to protect your systems. And if, you're not, if you don't know where the threats are, how can you fix them? So Sterling Riggs Jerkoff did the only responsible thing a journalist can do when it no longer fits his narrative and the story no longer uh, goes to what he wants to say. He deleted the whole thread. Those are the only three screenshots of it in existence. Because it's gone now, because it didn't fit his story. Hackers weren't being scary enough for him. Hackers weren't being antisocial enough for him. Hackers weren't being criminal enough for him. And guess what? You're a hypocrite. And so am I. And I'm not going to talk about your hypocrisy. I'm going to talk about my hypocrisy. Because I love making fun of the McDonald's hot coffee lady. Does everybody know about the McDonald's hot coffee lady? She's the reason why coffee cups say coffee is hot. Don't drink shampoo. Toothpaste doesn't go in the eye. She's that lady. What up with her, man? She's a laughing stock. She freaking gets a little bitty burn, and we all have to pay for it. McDonald's had to pay $2.9 million for this greedy lady. That's an awesome story to tell for funniness, except for one problem. It's not true. This is the McDonald's coffee lady. She got third-degree burns over 15% of her body requiring skin grafts to repair the damage because McDonald's served the coffee at 180 degrees to 190 degrees Fahrenheit. This list of people in pink were also people admitted to the emergency room for the same kind of damage. She went to McDonald's, fix me. It's like, you know, pay for my emergency bills, pay for my bills, not pay me money, pay for my bills. McDonald's reply at first was, here's $800, no fries with that. So she sued them. The jury awarded her $2.9 million. That is not a number that they just came up out of the air. That is two days of coffee sales, just coffee sales, no Happy Meals, just coffee sales for two days at McDonald's. She's not even received $500,000 of that. So we're hypocrites because I loved making fun of this lady because the press told me that it was okay to make fun of her. The press told me this is what the story was, and I believed it, and I didn't go any further into it. And she didn't have a voice to say it was different. Here's one that makes the hackers a little upset, because what about these guys? The police, defending against police hating hackers. Why would they ever get that image of us hating them, right? Except for that they're fascists and stuff, you know, and they're trampling our rights, and they're trying to shoot us all the time. Besides that, you know, it's like, why would they think that, well, guess what, hypocrites? Here's some police officers. They don't look so deadly. They don't look so bad. They look like they're actually there to, uh, what's, that, what's that, protect and serve. Maybe they got that job because they wanted to help people. Maybe they got that job because they wanted to actually be these people. And that's why they're there for it. But, but you're saying, but they, they all posed for these pictures. They all knew these pictures were being taken. What happens when you see them when they don't know that they're being taken? Let's show some pictures of when they don't know when they're being photographed. Like when they're buying titty shoes 
for a homeless man, when they're carrying the groceries for a paraplegic and stuff home for him, when they see a lady and her family in the rain and they put her in the back of the police car so she won't be wet, it's like when they go and find out that a guy who was delivering pizza for his job and stuff was in a car accident, they delivered the last pizza for him. They didn't pose for these pictures. They didn't want these pictures taken. They didn't know they were being taken. They were doing their job. They were doing what they were called to do, helping others. That gentleman right there in the middle, the last thing he did on this planet was feed that child, walked out of that restaurant, and was killed, not because of who he was, but because of what he was. Because that's part of his job, to take that bullet. So a normal citizen wouldn't. Those are police officers. There are over 800,000 police officers in this country. You show me a pool of 800,000 doctors, and you show me that they're all good. You show me an 800,000 pool of uh, firefighters, and you show me they're all good. You show me a pool of 80 lawyers, and you show me that they're all good. <laughs> the problem with the police is that we're hiring humans. And until you stop hiring humans, that's, you're going to keep having that. Nobody's perfect. Well, then you got RoboCop, and that's a whole other talk, I think. It's like, but there you go. That's what you have to worry about. It's like we're just as hypocritical because we see the press now. We see the story and the narrative that police officers are just fascist, not understanding that is a small representation, a very small microchasm of the general thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of police officers are going about their business, not making it to the news because they're saving people's lives and they're doing their job. And they're not doing it for credit, they're doing it because that's what they were called for. So if you don't want the press to see you as a, as a criminal, stop trying to see every police officer as a fascist. Because the press is doing the same thing to them that they're doing to us. So now we know that there's a problem. What do we do about it? How do we go about fixing it? It's like, well, guess what? This isn't a talk of doom and gloom and stuff, you know, and trying to reclaim the word hacker. This is a talk about saying we're already doing it. You've got Jay Coons, you've got Jobbage, you've got uh, Bill Gardner, uh, Evan Booth, you've got Dan Kaminsky. Krebs on security, one of the best reporters on uh, information security and hacking and stuff, you know, is out there. And then you've got Dave Kennedy. You may have all seen Dave Kennedy on Fox News and CNBC and Fox News testifying before Congress and then on Fox News and then uh, on, uh, what was it, a Katie Couric show and then Fox News. It's like, whenever I see him in real life and he doesn't have a Fox Chiron going underneath him, it's like, it just amazes me. It's like, you know, so, uh, but I mean, they're actually, and one of the things I like about it is not because that they're reporting and that they're out there. It's because Dave says, I'm a hacker and I'm here to protect you. I'm here to help. We're from the internet. We're here to help, right? It's like, that's always good. That's always reassuring, right? It's like, that's what I like about these guys. They claim, I know, it's like, and I think that's adorable. Okay. It's like, uh, but that's, that's what's so awesome about this is that they're trying to do it. Because trust me, my question, though, isn't like, oh, kudos to these guys. Kudos to these guys for spreading the word. They're doing a great job. We're good. Why not you? Why aren't you out there helping? Why aren't you talking to your local press, your local newspaper, your local television show, local radio show, and getting the proper right information out there saying, hey, I do hacking, so you know, I do security. This is what this topic is about. You can do that. That's not trying to, you know, fame mongering or trying to get your name out. That's trying to help your community get better educated. That's what you should be doing. Because if you don't do that, guys like this will. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Gregory Evans. He's the world's number one hacker or the one number one hacker full of number two as far as I'm concerned. It's like, because if you're not, then you've got these other guys just spreading the information and stuff, you know, for profit. And that doesn't help anybody but them. So I decided to create this site. It's called iRonin. It's like all it's basically doing is giving you information and resources to help you become a message out there to help you better educate people, to get better information, to help spread the word of what hacking is and what the security threats are. And I had a, just recently, I just, uh, when I came back from this one conference, I started some people arguing on Twitter. One of the biggest responses to me was, wow, Jason, 1990s called, they want their uh, debate back. It's like, oh, why are you fighting this hopeless war about hackers? Screw you. 
okay? Because I don't choose a fight because it's easy. I don't choose a fight because I think it's winnable. I choose a fight because it's right. And that's what we should do. We don't give up because this word is gone. We don't give up because that's the way the press is reporting it. We keep going because it's going to actually win in our favor if we keep up the fight. Instead of giving up and losing and adding more Facebook likes and trying to get enough retweets to make change happen. That's not going to work. You see people attacking Josh Corman and I am the Calvary. And I don't just agree with everything that he says. But by God, at least he's trying to do something about it. At least he's trying to help out people. At least he's trying to help create this community. What are you doing? Besides creating parody accounts and attacking people online. Get out there and do something or shut up and let someone else do the work. That's what we need to think about. It's like this word is not gone. This, word, this war is not over. It is until everybody starts giving up and thinking that it's okay to be seen as a criminal. I'm sorry. This is what we do. Blood code. One of the biggest blood drives in Nevada state history. Done by hackers. Be the match at DEF CON for marrow donors. Done at DEF CON. Hackers trying to help save lives. Thomas Wilhelm has saved a life by donating bone marrow. What are some of those parody accounts have done to change something? Johnny Long, hacker, changing Uganda, creating a job employment opportunities, creating hope in that place. And he's a hacker. His whole thing is hackers for charity, which is great to explain on a t-shirt and stuff. You know, when someone's like, how dare you hack charity? You know, it's always a good conversation starter, trust me. It's like, so it's like, he's out there doing good works. And when I talk about global, I mean global. What about this guy in the middle, China Eagle? I know some of you Intel guys know who that guy is, but you know what else he does? He's the Johnny Long of China. He goes throughout Western China and puts in computer systems for rural schools trying to help them get onto the internet, help to educate them. He hates criminals. He hates carters. He puts them in jail for China. It's like because he's a patriot. And I love the reaction, like people are going, wait, wait, you can be a patriot in another country? They have those? Is that cool? You know, it's like, they do. He's a great upstanding citizen, a great person. He's just, you know, playing for the other team, I guess, right? But you still have to respect that because our community is not based on boundaries. Our community is not based on geopolitical ties or race or creed or sexuality. Our community is based on what we have in common, what unites us, and that's that human curiosity, that human curiosity and drive to want to do something different and want to make something happen. That's who we are. That's what our community should be about, not by uh, the weird, stupid things about imaginary lines on a planet. Here's some other hackers. Dual core, educating the masses through his music. You got Eddie the Yeti with his art saying, I'm a hacker, I break into buildings for a living, but look at all the cool art dude. And he doesn't just do regular art, he uses organic ink and materials and stuff. He hacks art. It's like he uses soy sauce and all these other uh, mediums and stuff to create his art. Fabs, once again, she hacks the machine. She hacks sewing machines to create different patterns, to create QR codes, and she creates a human genome on a, on a scarf. It's pretty awesome. It's like, that's a hacker. And you got hacker strip in India. It's like a freaking FUD, FUD selling fraudulent tour box and stuff, you know, on Kickstarter gets over $50,000 in less than a week. They're asking for $10,000 on Indigo to create a graphic novel to help educate people and teach people about hacking through cartoon forms. They haven't even gotten to $3,000 yet. Because people want the fraud box because that makes them feel better. It's like, so this is what the people, these are hackers out here doing what they do. And we have to do that because trust me, if we don't, who's going to? Because we've got people like this out there. Hackers are breeding. I know it's a, you know, a funny thought and scary thought, but we're actually creating offspring, okay? And, and do you really want your child to be in a world and stuff, you know, where when, you, when they tell their schoolmate that my dad's a hacker, my, uh, my mom's a hacker, and they say, well, hackers stole my dad's credit cards. A hacker stole my mom's email. Do you want to live like that? Do you want your children to be able to see that? And that's wrong, and that's on us. 
Because one of the biggest problems we have is we like to think we're special. This thing says future hacker. Wrong. Born hacker. We were all born with that curiosity. We were all born with that innate ability to say, what if? It's like, I am sorry to tell you, you are not a special snowflake in this special snowflake blizzard, people. Hacking is part of who we are. It's in our DNA. It's just what we do. And until you stop trying to be that special one and making those people feel like they're not because they don't do hacking, and instead start educating them and telling them, you're just as a hacker as I am. You just don't do something with it the way I do it. You do it this way or you try to do it this way. It's like you're still just as much as a hacker. They're still going to see us as the odd ones. They're still going to see us as the outsider. And that's something that we need to change. Because these are hackers. It's like, look, this is how it starts. It's like this young lady in the lower left-hand corner's grandfather has Parkinson's. So what did she do? She created a cup he can hold and drink without having to spilling it. It's done so much it's being mass-produced now for all Parkinson's patients. This, uh, this boy up here in the upper uh, corner and stuff, you know, uh, grandfather has Alzheimer's. So he created a revolutionary product for them. It's like uh, right here is Reuben Paul, eight years old, presenting in New Delhi at a conference, getting Shell through Metasploit and Set on Kali Linux and stuff, you know, on a Windows 8 machine. He's already developed apps that are available on the App Store. It's like that's what he's doing. Hacking is who we are. It's as soon as we're uh, able to go out and start. We started social engineering when we were in diapers, right? We've all social engineered. Hey, if I cry more, I get more. That works, right? We were born with this ability. So now that we know it, now that we see other people doing it, why can't we change it? Why is it a hopeless cause? Why is it an uh, unwinnable war? It's not if we don't give up. It's not if we just keep the voice going. Keep the conversation going. Not the screaming, which I do a lot of, not the tweeting, not the liking, but the communication. Create the conversations. Keep them going. And I know that's hard for us because, you know, we don't like to actually interact with humans because they're scary and, you know, all fleshy and stuff, right? It's like, but we have to. We have to reach outside of this echo chamber. This is a great talk to give to you because you all agree more or less with what I say and stuff, you know, about the image. But I've, some of the best talks I've given were to intelligence and security analysts in San Antonio. Was giving it to a bunch of bankers and stuff, you know, on the West Coast. Giving it to the people outside of this group, outside of this community, and showing them what hackers really are. Letting them get upset with some of the stuff that I said, but it created a dialogue and it created great conversations where they got to see what hacking is really about and how I see how hacking is. Because once again, this was my perceptions, my perspective. And I also put that quote in there for Wendy because she's cool and I wanted to make her happy. That being done, that being said, going totally over, which is not as over as I thought it would be, I'm done. Okay.